Kevin, what are you doing? Oh, uh, I'm actually giving to the church. I'm tithing through the church app, see? Huh, oh wow, I didn't realize people can give through the app. I started giving online through the church website. You just go to redlandbaptist.org on your laptop or other device and click on the tab giving. Way to go, Peggy. Thanks, Bill. What's nice is I can make my gift one time, like for the Easter offering, or weekly, or bi-weekly, or monthly, whatever I need. Hey guys, I, I give my tithe through a thing called a check that I write. A check? Is that new? No, Kevin, it's actually old, but it's a tried but true method for many people. Huh, okay. Well, how does it get to the church? What, what do you fax it or something? No, you can just put it in an envelope and mail it to the U.S. mail, or some people put it in their tithe envelope and just stick the envelope through the slot in the church office. Hey, I give through my bank. How does that work, Bill? Well, most banks have an online bill pay feature, and I use that and set up Redland Baptist Church to receive my regular giving. That way, the bank writes and mails the check for me. Easy as pie. Man, I am so thankful that we have such a tech-savvy staff. <laughs> yeah. That's us. But it is great that there are different ways to give that can work for everybody. Hey, Kevin, are you giving to the church again? Um, yeah.
beautiful Rachel and Judy. Uh, thank you for using your amazing talents so faithfully, the talents God has given you, to remind us of our Father's truly amazing grace. We, we praise God for you too. Thank you. You know, many years ago, I served on staff at a church in northern Delaware, and my part of my responsibilities there included discipleship. Well, one week it came to my attention that one of our children's Sunday school teachers had a behavior problem with her class. Now, it wasn't because she didn't prepare well. She did. She was an excellent teacher. It's just she was kind of small, and I guess the kids thought they could take advantage of her. Plus, her group happened to have a lot of PKs, DKs, and MKs in it. That's preacher's kids, deacon's kids, missionary's kids. Just kidding about that. Uh, they were just rowdy. That's just the way they were. There was a rowdy group of second graders. Well, the solution to our problem was her husband. You see, her husband was big. He was very big. He was well over six feet tall, uh, very well built. Uh, think of uh, this. Dwayne the Rock Johnson with a Bible, and you get the idea. Well, this guy's name was not Dwayne. His name was Jed. And the moment Jed walked into that classroom for the first time, those kids stopped misbehaving. Uh, Jed's huge presence was just too intimidating for them. In fact, the teacher discovered that any time they started to misbehave, she, she had no reason to fear because Jed was there. And whenever they would do that, well, she would just nod to her husband and he would stand up. And when he did, towering over those little guys and gals, they would instantly get right back into line. This morning, we're studying another faith hero in Hebrews chapter 11, a man named Gideon. And Gideon's life illustrates the fact that one of the keys to victory in life is our understanding that you and I, we have someone like Jed standing at our side, only he's much, much bigger. Of course, I'm referring to our Heavenly Father, and with him with us, well, like those rowdy little ones in that second grade class, the problems of life get right back into line. Gideon's story is recorded in chapters 6 through 8 of the book of Judges. I want you to open your Bibles to those chapters and keep them open. We'll go down through them today. Now, Gideon, Gideon lived in a sad period in the history of Israel that spanned seven repeated cycles. Here's how it would work. The people would rebel against God and they would begin to worship the pagan idols, the false gods of the people around them. Then they would suffer the painful consequences of that sin, and they would cry out to God for help, and he would send them help in the form of a judge. The judge would deliver them, and for a while the people would, would worship God, but when the judge died and people forgot about him or her, they would rebel against God again, and the cycle would start all over. This cycle lasted nearly three centuries, and Gideon was the fourth of these judges. And his ministry began with the same phrase that got all the other judges started. It's right there in verse 1 of chapter 6, where it says, Once again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. This time, the consequence of that evil, the consequence of worshiping those false gods, came in the form of a group of people known as the Midianites. And their mode of attacking the Israelites was, well, let's say it was unique. They used something called a camel. Now, that may not sound like much of a threat to you and me. I mean, we're, we're familiar with very sophisticated weapons of war like smart bombs and chain machine guns and stealth bombers and all that stuff. But in the 12th century BC, camels gave the Midianites an enormous military advantage. I mean, not only were they ugly enough to scare the bravest Israelite soldier. Isn't that scary? <laughs> um, they also gave the Midianites a long-range mobile attack capability. Uh, a swift ability to come and leave and, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and the Hebrews were, they didn't have anything like that. They were entirely dependent on foot soldiers. Now, a camel can travel three or four days with a heavy load on its back, and it could cover 300 miles without food or water. So instead of invading and occupying Israel, well, the Midianites would simply wait until they knew harvest time had arrived, and then they'd mount their camels, and they would move in from the desert. They would cross the Jordan in huge numbers, like a plague of locusts. They would strip 
the entire nation bare of grain and vegetables and fruit and, and livestock. And then were their camels loaded down with spoil? Well, they would cross back across the desert and live there until the next harvest time. They did this for seven years, and this left Israel in a desperate situation. People were reduced to hiding food in, in mountain caves and dens, and it was also an incredibly humiliating thing for God's chosen people. I mean, they knew they were vulnerable. They knew that an, an attack could come at any time. So not only were they constantly hungry, they lived in a constant state of, of fear. Verse 6 puts it this way. They were brought very low because of Midian. Well, then Gideon, in answer to their prayers, God sent Gideon, and he appears on the scene. His name means hacker or hewer, and that would seem to be a name for a man of great strength, you know, and, and courage. But when we get our first look at Gideon, we see he's anything but that. He's cowering under a tree, threshing grain in a wine press. Now, normally, the way you do that was you would have a wooden threshing floor, and you would have it in an exposed place so that the wind could carry away the chaff. And you'd use a, a big threshing sledge towed by big oxen. But Gideon was trying to do this. He was trying to separate the grain from the chaff by walking on it with his bare feet. And he was doing this hidden under a tree for fear of the marauding Midianites showing up, which is why I'm preaching here, hidden behind the preschool desk. So, you know, no one will see me preaching. Anyhow, as Gideon was doing this, a man approached and sat down under a tree and watched. But actually, it wasn't a man. It was the angel of the Lord, the Bible says. And that phrase is used in the Old Testament to refer to Jesus himself in his pre-incarnate form, taking the form of an angel and visiting the earth. You may remember he visited Joshua in the same way. Now, if I didn't know the Lord better... I might think that he was mocking Gideon with the first words that he said to him because he said, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And that sounds mocking because any, Gideon was anything but valiant at this point in his life. He was, he was more of a cowardly, beleaguered victim. I'm reminded of the old story of the man who came to a psychiatrist with a problem. He said, Doctor, you've got to help me. Everything is going wrong. I feel worthless. My friends tell me I have a terrible inferiority complex. Can you help me, Doc? Well, the psychiatrist told him that he would give him some tests, and he did, and these tests were to evaluate his situation, you know. A week later, the, the test results were in, and he went back to see the psychiatrist, and he said, Friend, i got some good news for you, and I've got some bad news for you. The good news is that the tests have shown that you do not have a complex. There is no doubt about that. That's the good news. The bad news is... You really are inferior. Ha uh ha. -huh. Well, that could have been Gideon. He was inferior, at least in his judgment and the judgment of his peers. And in verse 15, he pointed this out to God. He said that he was of the tribe of Manasseh, which was the lowest and the weakest tribe in all Israel. Then he said that his family was the lowest and weakest family in the tribe of Manasseh. And then he said he was the lowest and weakest member of his family. So, he was the lowest and weakest member of the lowest and weakest family of the lowest and weakest tribe in all of Israel. Pretty low. I mean, Gideon was not a big guy in any sense of the word. He was no Samson. He was no David. He was definitely no Jed or no The Rock, you know. Well, God's reply to all of Gideon's excuses of inferiority was simply this. He said, I will be with you, Gideon. And that's the main point I want us to take this morning from his faith story. You see, when it comes to dealing with the, the fears of life, the struggles of life, it's not a matter of who you are, but rather a matter of who's with you. And Gideon, Gideon definitely needed help in understanding this principle because in his mind, well, God was distant and little and not caring and not very powerful. He was a far away God in his mind. And when you and I make that mistake, and we do, when we make the mistake of thinking of God in that flawed way, well, we live in a world where, like Gideon, we are always fearfully facing defeat. We have to settle with the, a, a, a threshing wheat in the wine press kind of life. Because the Midianites of our world, including the pandemics like we're, we've been going through, 
or they're just too big for us and we think too big for God. In our minds, all we can do is strive to survive. Well, God told him, Gideon, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midianite's, Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? And here we, here we hear it. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least of my family. Now look at your Bibles. How did God respond to that? Did he say, well, no, Gideon. You're not little. You're not incapable. Why, your natural charm and good looks are utterly sufficient for this task. You can do this. You're strong enough. Did God say that? Everybody go like that. No. Look at verse 16. Here's what God said. I will be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites as if they were but one man. Now that's the hinge of where everything turns, not just for Gideon, but for those of us who live like him. You see, what is unthinkable and undoable on our own well, becomes unstoppable when we realize that God is right here with us. God was teaching Gideon and teaching us as well that we don't have to be afraid of the Midianites of life. God is great. He's greater than anything we face. And he is always with us. Well, Gideon began to understand this important principle as he accomplished the first task that God gave him. Here's the task. He was to tear down an altar to Baal that was in his own neighborhood. Now the Midianites and many other peoples in the Mesopotamian area worshipped this false god, Baal. And that worship involved horrible things. Immoral sexual acts, temple prostitution, supposedly to make the earth more fertile. It also included infant child sacrifice. In short, the worship of evil was of Baal rather was evil. It was wicked. It was satanic. It had to end, and God chose Gideon to do that by tearing Baal's altar down. But here's the kicker in this part of the story. This altar was not built by the Midianites. It was built by the Israelites. Worse yet, it was built by Gideon's own father. Now let me ask you, how often do you think Gideon had stood up to his dad? Well, I'm thinking never, because the Bible says Gideon did as the Lord told him, but because he was afraid of his family and the men of the town, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. Well, the cool thing is when Gideon's dad found out what he had done and all the other town people did and they were angry, here's what he said. He said, listen, guys, if Baal is really God, Baal can take care of himself. Chill. Apparently, Gideon's big God faith was contagious. His dad was picking up on it. But then God called Gideon to do what he'd originally called him to do, to go up against the camel-riding Midianites to free his people. Now, Gideon was understandably afraid and responded to God's command by saying, Lord, if, notice it doesn't say when, it says, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, look, I'm going to place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry in the morning, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. Now this is where the practice of laying a fleece before the Lord to see if it's his will. This is where all that got started. And I want you to understand that this fleece deal is not a positive thing in Scripture. God had already promised Gideon he was going to save Israel. So this fleece deal was not an expression of trust but rather an expression of Gideon's immature walk-by-sight faith. I'm reminded of the story of a guy who was driving down the road. He sees a bakery and he says, All right, Lord, here's the fleece I'm going to cast. If there's a parking space in front of that bakery when I drive by, then I will know it's your will for me to go inside and eat a donut. And sure enough, on his fifth time around the block, he found an open parking space. Silly, right? Yeah. Well, as you can see here in Judges, God was gracious. He did with the fleece as Gideon requested, not once, but, but twice. And with that fleece stuff behind him, Gideon was finally ready to go. In chapter 7, you see Gideon and his men went to war against the Midianites and their camels. Gideon recruited 32,000 Hebrews to join him. Now, that's cool, but the Midianites had an army of 135,000 which means Gideon and his forces were outnumbered four to one. Well, at this point, God came to Gideon, and he said something like this. This is my paraphrase. 
The enemy has 135,000 troops. You have 32,000, Gideon. You've got number problems. And I imagine Gideon replying something like this. God, I'm so glad to hear you say that. I was afraid you are going to make me go into battle outnumbered four to one. We do have number problems. But God said, no, Gideon, that's not your number problem. The issue is you don't need as many soldiers as you have. This is my battle. So I want you to send home everyone who's afraid. Well, it turned out the majority of Gideon's troop were, troops were afraid. 22,000 soldiers went home, which leaves Gideon with how many? Right, 10,000 troops, meaning he was now outnumbered more than 13 to 1. Well, God came to Gideon again and said, you still got a number problem, Gideon. There are still too many men. Here's what you do. Take them down to the water, and I will sift them for you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. Separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. Now, how many lapped water in their hands like a dog? Right, 300. Only 300. All the rest got, up, got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, Well, with these 300 men that lapped, I will save you from the Midianites. I will deliver the Midianites into your hands. Now, have you ever wondered why God chose the dog lappers? You know, I've heard people say all my life that they were picked because they proved themselves more attentive to an enemy. You know, they were looking so they could lap while they looked to see if someone was coming. And that could be, but this week I changed my mind on that. You see, in the Bible, anytime someone is compared to a dog or, or referred to as a dog, it's always derogatory. It's never complimentary. Now, I know that, that makes all you cat people happy, you know. Uh, but seriously, the point is this. The Bible is not sentimental about dogs, like, like dog, peoples are, dog people are rather with their dogs today. Dog people love their dogs. They, they care for their dogs. They'll do almost anything for their precious puppies. By the way, I have a new grand puppy, a new grand dog. His name is Dallas. Uh, Andrew and my daughter Becca, she and her husband, they, they bought an Australian Shepherd as a puppy and they named him Dallas after Becca's favorite Christian author, Dallas Willard. Maybe he's your favorite author too. Well, little puppy Dallas is so cute and soft and cuddly. He loves to play with you and he, he even loves to pray like his namesake. In fact, uh, here he is kneeling at his prayer bench for his morning prayers. That's a joke, I don't think so. Anyhow, last week, Dallas got into some mischief and swallowed two grapes. And, and when Beck and Andrew decided to check and see if that was okay, they found out that grapes are very poisonous to dogs. So they, they rushed him to the, the closest vet. And that doctor charged them hundreds of dollars, you know, IV treatment, the whole deal, to save the little guy. But they happily paid those hundreds of dollars because they love Dallas. And I bet most of you would do the same thing for your puppies. Perhaps even you cat people would do that for a sick puppy, you know. Well, dogs are not looked that way in the Bible. They're always looked at as being dirty and detestable, right down there with, with rats and other vermin. So to compare Gideon's 300 men to dogs, well, that wasn't a compliment. Old Testament scholar Doug Stewart puts it like this, and I quote, Most likely the idea is that the guys who lacked water like dogs drank it in a way drank it in a way that we would consider to be geeky, unclean, nerdish. In short, these were not elite troops. The whole point of God winnowing the troops down was to make clear that victory was God's alone. So God left uh, Gideon with 300 dog lappers, 300 geeky guys who would probably trip over their swords as they went into battle. Well, end quote. Well, now the Midian soldiers outnumber the Israelites how many? Right, 450 to 1. And to reassure poor scaredy cat Gideon, God gave him one more sign that he was with him in the form of a, a dream he sent to a Midianite soldier. And you can read and see how that, that took place. And that gave Gideon the courage to, to fight. He did. And miraculously, the Midianites took off running. Israel was free, and they knew who had freed him. It wasn't those 300 dog lappers. No, it was the one true Almighty God. You know, like Gideon and his peers, you and I, we all deal with anxiety. We, we deal with fear. 
I came across an article in the New York Times this week that said that scientists working on the Human Genome Project have identified what they refer to as the worry gene. It's the SLC684 gene on chromosome 17Q12, to be precise. They say that people who have the short version of that gene are especially prone to worry or anxiety. You know, I bet that right now many of you are afraid that, oh my goodness, I probably have the short version of that gene. <laughs> you see, all of us worry so very easily. It, it, it gets to us in our, in our hearts without our even knowing it, doesn't it? Would you agree? The thing we have to remember is that no matter how short our SLC684 gene is, and no matter how long our worry lists are, God is enough, more than enough. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, all things through him who is with me, at my side. Now, if you've never experienced this God with you that we're talking about here, the way that you do that is to repent of your sin and ask Jesus to come into your heart and life. He is bigger than your problems. He's bigger than your failures. He's bigger than your regrets. He's bigger than your sin, bigger than your guilt. In fact, the empty tomb that... Peggy talked about this past Thursday, proves that he's bigger even than death itself, the thing you fear most. Once you put your faith in Jesus, you will never face a fear, never face a struggle again alone. God Almighty God will be with you at your side and he will never leave you or forsake you wherever you go. Would you pray with me? Father God, we confess that we so often forget who you are and because of that, we make ourselves susceptible to fear. Help us, Father. Fill our hearts and minds with an accurate understanding of your attributes, especially your great love and amazing grace. Fill us with faith so that we walk by it and not sight, trusting you to lead us. And Father, I ask that you would heal our land of this, this virus, that you would take it away. I also pray, Father, in all humility, that you would heal our land of racism and all the evil it brings with it. I pray, Father, that you would be with the families of these two men, these two young men who have suffered the, the, the great um, inhumanity they did this week and losing their lives because of racism. I pray for our brothers and sisters of color. Help us to empathize with them. Help us to feel their hurt. Help us to help them, God, for they are dear to us. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I would remind you that uh, you have a survey to complete. You probably got it in your email inbox yesterday. So please get that in to us as quick as possible. We need that information in order to plan how and when we're going to come back on our campus uh, when Phase 1 ends, which, by the way, should be in about two weeks and a day from when you hear this sermon. Uh, so get those, those uh, surveys in, okay? Now, say it with me. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you are called to peace. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And this week, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. I look forward to seeing you, and I believe it's going to be soon.